on the line and finding love becomes very, very difficult. During the Valentine's Day, we started this topic on finding love again. And we said, how do you find love again? Give thanks, my darling. In all things, the Bible says we must give thanks. You need to thank the Lord for what you went through. I always say it, that the same thing you went through, somebody went through and ended up in the psychiatric hospital. Somebody went through, ended up dead. Somebody went through and never, never found love again. I mean, never. So in all things, just give thanks. You may never know what the Lord has for you and the lessons God wants you to learn out of it. And the second thing I said is give yourself time to heal. We'll be talking about the mistakes people do when they are finding love again. A lot of times we, we want to prove a point. We want to prove that we did. We want to prove that the mistake wasn't from us. We want to prove that it's our ex. We want to prove things. So we rush into, into entering into another love, into another relationship. And we end up realizing that we moved from, let me use the typical Ghanaian phrase, moving from frying pan to fire. I mean, things get worse. And then you think that, oh, love is not for me. Relationship is not for me. Marriage is not for me. My darling, relationship and love is for everyone. God wants everyone to, to find love and fall in love. Maybe you rush through it. So whilst you are finding love again, give yourself time to heal. And we said that um, whilst you are finding time to heal, if it's possible, you know, go through therapy. And today you will know the importance of going through therapy whilst you are finding love again. And I also said forgive yourself and forgive your ex. Sometimes it's very difficult. I mean... I wouldn't sit here and pretend that it's, it's as easy as ABC. Forgiving your ex is very, very difficult. Anytime you remember the things he did to you, sometimes it's not even the things he did to you whilst in the relationship, but the things they do after you break up, the lies. I mean, it's, it's, it can be very painful, but the Bible still wants you to forgive. You are not only forgiving him or her, but you are also forgiving yourself. Sometimes it's so difficult forgive, to forgive yourself. Why did I even enter into the relationship in the first time? Why did I go through these mistakes? Why did I do this to myself? Uh, my darling, if you are not careful, you will ask why and why and why, and you will never find love again. Please forgive yourself and then forgive your ex. The other thing that we spoke about is you need a support system. My darling, you can't do this all by yourself. Don't lock yourself up in the room from morning till evening, crying and crying and crying. You need friends around you. You need family members around you. You need to share sometimes what you are going through. So people will understand you and, and be there for you. So please, you need the support system from family, from friends. And then the other thing we also spoke about is creating a change in your environment. I believe so much in that. Sometimes you don't find love again or you stay in your pain and your head because you don't change the environment around you. When I want to change things around me, the first thing I do is to change my immediate environment, my bedroom. Sometimes changing a bed, changing your curtains, changing your bed sheets, changing uh, the way where you put your wardrobe. I mean, these little things psychologically changes your mood. Um, sometimes instead of the dull things in your room, Maybe going in for white, bright colors, change your wardrobe, the kind of clothes you wear, your haircut, all those things. You'll be surprised what it does for you. 
And then I said, if you want love again, go out there and find love. If you stay from home to work, home to work, home to work, my darling, you will never find love again. Go out there and find love. You'll be surprised that there's somebody out there looking for you. If you don't go there looking for the person, the person will not come looking for you. If you don't go out to have fun, how do you know there's somebody out there looking for you? If you don't travel around, how do you meet new people? My darling, go out there and find love. Today, I have a wonderful person, very, very wonderful person with us. Very wonderful person. He's been here several times. Apart from being here and speaking to us and we falling in love with him, I have recommended a lot of people to see, to see him. And everybody I have recommended and asked them to see him, they come back with, with I mean, good testimonies about him. And they keep telling me, why did we go round, 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 round? One person came to me and said, Mommy, I was talking to the right guys. If I had met Dr. Seth much earlier, I believe I would have found love a long time ago. <laughs> I believe I would have healed a long time ago. I believe things would have been better for me a long time ago. My darling, I have found a treasure. I have found a jewel. I have found somebody who knows the staff. I mean, you get people who have everything, the PhDs, the everything, but you realize that they went through the school. The school didn't go into them. But I have found somebody who didn't just pass through the school, but the school actually went through him. You realize that for him, this is his calling. Pleasure is mine to introduce to you again to family life with Mama Rita, Dr. Seth Asafo. Thank you, Ma. <laughs> Dr. Seth, okay. my people are falling in love with you. I mean, they <laughs> love you. Everybody I have recommended to see you come back telling me, Mama Rita, the guy is Mama good. It's by grace. It's by grace. It's just by grace. So how do you do it? How do you have time for everything, for everybody? You are going for conferences all around the place. You are lecturing in the medical school. Um, you are there as a counselor in Ghana International School. You are meeting individuals. Now somebody is calling me <clears throat> that um, she wants the mom to meet up with you. I think the mom is going through, um, how do you call it, the one that they tend to forget a lot. Dementia. Dementia. The mom is going through dementia and sometimes it gets very violent mm. and wants to meet you. And said, oh, they called a few times and didn't get... You, I told them, as for you, your phone is 24-7. The only time they won't get you if you are out for a rest. That one. So um, if I meet up with you, I will talk to you. How do you do it? How do you have time for everything? I would say I do it the same way you do it. You are passionate about what you do. That's true. And I'm passionate about what I wow. do. So it, it's never stressful. It is just... Wow something you enjoy doing and there's nothing wow. more um rewarding wow. than somebody coming to see you in a down mood and leaving with lifted spirits mm. so that is our greatest reward wow really. wow so dr Seth is telling us something that for everything you do Passion. you must love what you do the truth is that people ask me how do i do what i do I do what I, I, I do because I'm in love with my job. I mean, that's the truth. Apart from falling in love with Jesus and falling in love with my husband, the next thing 
I am in love with is I'm in love with my job. I enjoy what I do. I love it being on family life. I love it when, when people come into my office crying and they are going back laughing and smiling. I love it but when couples come to me and they're on the verge of breaking their marriage and I see them 20 years after and they are still in the relationship 30 years after and they are still, I mean, I love what I do. I love it when I come for, I meet people out for counseling. Doctor said, what affected my sleep? Now I'm healed. Amen. Was that I used to come here because of um, the working class. They can't see you during the day. During the day, they are to work. Mm -hmm. So I decided, let me make time for them in the evenings. So I used to start counseling at 6 p.m., sometimes 6 p.m., 7 p.m., when they close from work. Oh, my God. That is when I realized when people have issues, they will go to any length and any extent. True. I would do counseling from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., Wow. People sit down. They don't care. They are going to work the following day. People sit down. Hey, I just remembered. My daughter recommended somebody to me, and I said, I'll make time for, oh, my God. So, you see, I, I think I need it to come. be. It will come. <laughs> I, I need to make time for them. So, my daughter came and said, Mommy, I think you'll be the only one who will handle their will be able to handle their case. They've gone to see so many men and women of God that they have. I mean, I'm in love with what I do. Absolutely. I'm in love. So, my darling, if you are doing something that you are not in love with, please, 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 please think twice before you go into that thing. If you are not in love with it, forget it. That is why I have a problem with. People that go into professions they are not in love with, they go into teaching because their they parents the said, mm -hmm. or because they are they are result. They go into nursing. When you you see the people that are in love with nursing, you see the florist nine tickles. I mean, it doesn't matter who. Oh, so I'm glad. I'm glad, and I'm glad that you are in love with what you do. And I think you really. But please, don't fall in love more than you love your wife and your children. Oh, <laughs> we because are trying our sometimes best. the mistake we do, really we fall right. in love so much with the job we do, such that we neglect the people around us, Very our true. wives, our husbands, our children. We think that as for them, they will forever be there for us. True. And some time ago, a lot of people didn't want to be parents of pastors. Why? Because they're so busy with everybody else. They are so busy with everyone else, mm. and they are not busy with their families. Anyway, so Dr. Seth, you are welcome. Thank you so much, Ron Rita. I'm happy to have this opportunity again. I've spoken so much. We've been talking about finding love again. Mm. And I've been looking at three categories of people. People whose spouses died, either their husbands died and they are, or their wives died. Sometimes it's difficult. They think that they can never get a replacement. They will never find anybody like their husbands. They will never find anybody like their wives. So they get so hurt, so bitter, that they never want to fall in love again. The second category of people are people who went through very painful relationships. They divorced and it's so difficult. I mean, it's been years, five years, 10 years, um, even more. Mm -hmm. And they think that for what they went through, they can never find love again. And then the third category of people are the people who are actually in relationship. Um, they never got married, just in a mere relationship. They gave out their heart so much. They fell so much um, in love with the people. Mm -hmm. The relationship broke up, and they never want to be vulnerable again. They tell themselves, marriage is not for me. Falling in love again is not for me. 
relationship is not for me. Let me sit my somewhere. Let me mind my business. Um, I was in a conference and even this situation came up where there are young people, 25 years, 26, 27, below the ages of 30, and they've told themselves, marriage, nalai. I prefer to go and do um, IVF. I don't mind having children, but falling in love again, it is out. Mm. Um, do you think it is possible to fall in love again? After all the challenges. After all the challenges. Of course. Absolutely. 1,000%. The reality is that um, human beings were created to connect. And that's why we don't thrive very well if we live in isolation. Um, in fact, let me just bring into sharp context what happened during COVID. Okay. So you see, during COVID when there was lockdown mm. and people couldn't go out, mm. for those that lived maybe alone, mm. they were always reporting very significant feelings of loneliness, feeling that things weren't as they wanted mm. it. Now, Truthfully, the telephones and the, uh, let me say, um, virtual connections, mm. they did their part. Mm. But at some point, you still craved human companionship. Mm. Mm. I remember I used to just come and stand in front of my house to see if I would find something. You find it. And that is why I say human beings, naturally, we are built to connect. So to stay in isolation is rather the painful part to do because it's actually easy to connect, regardless of whatever experience you've been through. It's all about understanding the context and mm. the approach. Mm. And you, if you give yourself mm. permission, mm. you can find love mm. again. Mm. You are reminding me of two things. During the COVID, I discovered that people we never knew had depression all of a sudden. Absolutely. People will walk to our house stand at the gate and say we have asked them to come when well, we haven't actually asked them to come and some of them had them bath for for how many days yeah just because they were depressed yes and uh, i mean one of the, the the factors that seems to spare on depression is loneliness or what we call feelings of loneliness. Now, there are people who can be in the midst of other people and mm. still feel lonely. Mm. And there are other people who feel lonely because they isolate from mm. others. And it tells you the power of human connection. So finding love is necessary. Wow. So, Dr. Seth, yes, I realize that love is the thing of the heart. I don't know how God connected love to the heart. Mm -hmm. When people either divorce, mm -hmm. one person dies, or they break up, how come or how does it affect their work output and everything about them? Yeah. We had one of the stories. I brought um, people to share their stories, you know, um, how they found love again. And one of the ladies, um, Pastor Jifa, was telling us when she went through the divorce, she could come to church without having her bath, and she didn't even realize it. She could come to church one month in a row wearing the same dress without, you know, changing, without washing it, and she didn't even realize it. So... How does love affect your work output, the way you dress? Um, I mean, how does it? Okay. So I, I would say that it's not just love. Okay. So what it is is that um, human beings, uh, our sense of safety mm. is from our ability to control things around okay. us. Now, basically, if you know your routines, it makes you feel comfortable. If mm. you think about it, if, for example, you're doing a routine and then somebody says, you have to do something else, mm. it unsettles you a little bit. Mm. And that unsettlement is because of the change. Now, 
in every broken relationship, mm. there is a void that is created. Okay. And the void comes because part of your life have become intertwined. Oh, wow. You used to do things together. together. Um, every day, there's a phone call. Mm. Every day, we'll come back home mm. together. Mm. Now, those things now become spots where your brain triggers that there's something wrong, there's something mm. wrong, there's something wrong. So logically, even though you know that you are broken up, mm. your brain hasn't learned it yet. Mm. Because what it is is, in those days, in the morning, mm. at 6 a.m., your phone will beep. Okay. He or she has sent a message, good okay. morning, my dear. Oh. Okay, now, your brain has become programmed to expect a message around that time. Mm. So when it's 6 a.m., mm. and then the message isn't coming, your brain starts to say, there's something wrong, there's something wrong, mm. there's something wrong. Mm. Most of the time, you cannot make the association that the message that hasn't come oh. is the reason. So once the brain starts to think about it, it also starts to worry. Now, mm. think about it that if they used to go to church together, okay. that has changed. That okay. transition has changed. Okay. It means you now have to do all these things mm. by yourself mm. using new resources mm. that did not exist. Mm. You mentioned something about how they say um, love there is the heart. Mm. Actually, love is not the heart, too. Okay. It's the brain. It's the brain. But one of the most significant things about the brain reacting mm. in terms of any kind of sensation mm. is the heartbeat. Mm. So, for example, when people fall in love, mm. you get close to the person. You can feel your heart beating. Mm. Now, you interpret your heart beating mm. as... I'm crazy about the person. Okay. But the reality is there are a lot of things happening in the background. Mm. The brain is, is saying, this is happening, this is happening, do this, do this. Mm. And your heart beating is just a reaction mm. to what is going on. Mm. Sometimes people have a heartbreak and they say, I can feel it in my heart. And they can feel it because when you have extreme disappointment mm. or loss or grief, mm. sometimes the heart loses its shape oh, okay. and so blood flow through it okay. can be painful okay. and it, technically we call it uh, takuchubo syndrome okay or um, break it down it is it's just it's just the heart because of a disappointment okay. it, it can it, its shape can change and mm. cause you to feel mm. that sensation mm. of pain mm. and that's why people call mm. it broken heart but okay. when it really comes to where we fall in love is the brain, brain that controls it. Wow. The, the, the seat of emotions is the human brain. Okay. So the limbic system, our amygdala, they are the things that control it. But mm. what we tend to feel outwardly mm. is how we explain it. Okay. So we might explain it is my heart mm. because my heart is beating so mm. much. Now, there have been some experiments where they say that imagine maybe you, are, you want to propose to somebody. Mm. You like them so much. Mm. Now, if you take them to a place mm. where something dramatic happens mm. and their heart is already beating mm. and then you, you tell them you mm. like them, that moment they will hardly forget mm. because there was, a, there was a sensation, a mm. significant sensation mm. and the process. Mm. So it's not entirely the heart. So, Dr. Seth, you said something that people go through what they go through after a breakup is that, for instance, you wake up in the morning, the room is empty. Yep. You wake up in the morning, you used to be receiving text messages um, or a phone call, and all of a sudden, you are not receiving it. What about the people who come out of a painful relationship? Because sometimes the, the, the relationship was abusive, either emotionally abusive, verbally abusive, um, physical abusive. For me, well, from where I sit, maybe because I haven't been through it, from where I sit, I should be happy that if I have come out of such a painful, I mean, I should wake up in the morning so happy, joyous. Why do they still go through? Very good question, Marita. Mm -hmm. And this is interesting. See, when people go through any kind of relationship, mm -hmm. because I mentioned that there's a routine that's created, mm -hmm. a disruption in the routine, even mm -hmm. if you consider the fact that it was an abusive relationship, still causes the brain to react and say, there is something wrong. Now, 
when you're on a journey with somebody and they are suddenly out of it, you haven't just, it, it is a perception of you have lost a part of you to that person also. So the person was abusive and all of that, which is true. But before they were abusive, they were nice. Before they were abusive, they came in with the whole Romeo vibe or Juliet vibe. So it was beautiful. And as a way of protecting mm. ourselves, mm. what our brain tends to do is that it tries to identify those good moments. Okay. And so for lots of people, you see, they hang on a little too long okay. in an abusive way. We all say, why didn't you get out? That's right. Now, they remember that one time, which was beautiful, and they start to do a process of rationalization where okay. they say, oh, there's something wrong somewhere. Mm. He or she is going through something. That's mm. why they are acting mm. the way they are. Mm. So when they have invested so much mm. resources, even mm. during the initiation of mm. the abuse, mm. to get out now is like, ah, after all that I've endured this, why would I go out now? It will be okay. Mm. So now when they finally get out, mm. there's a physical happiness of, ah, no more abuse. But at the same time, they miss that period where and for you some, could cook where i could cook and we could eat because that was a an amazing time that we shared together now there are people who even sympathize with the abusers so much it's okay. almost like they feel pity for the abuser wow so in a sense they can go on and on and on forever because they'll keep making excuses for the person wow and if you look at the process by which that comes there's no abuser that comes with a label abuser. That's they all true. come beautiful, As handsome. Angels. Angels. And, and then when things start to happen, one other underlying uh, process is many people don't understand. Because don't forget that while somebody is going through the abuse, on the outside, there are other people who are always telling them, you are beautiful, you are handsome, you are caring. But their partner tells them, you are nobody. You are nobody. And then... In you are not mind, beautiful. Sub- I don't love you. Absolutely. Subconsciously, all they keep saying is, I will make you see me. I will make you love me. So they keep on investing. But we know that it doesn't get anywhere. If you don't take a step back, it doesn't happen. So yes, there is joy. But equally, because they've been through a process for this long, mm. the change is too drastic. And it takes time for them to what? Mm. To engage. Now, wow. for many people in any rom- romantic relationship or even committed relationship, yeah. it's not just about the present, it's about the future. Wow. So when they break up, it's their future that has been crushed. That's the way the brain perceives it. Be- Say it again. When you are in a relationship, okay. you are looking at the future. Nobody stands in a relationship and be in the present. So okay. you started, oh, yes, I like to marry the person. That's okay. a future thinking. Okay. I like to have children with the okay. person. It's future. Okay. I like to have a home with the person, okay. a business with the person. Okay. So when there's a breakup, depending on where you are in that interaction, it is not just the breakup, but it's your future crashed perceptively. Because now it means that the picture you created about the person you were marrying on your mm. wedding day has changed. Mm. The children you have and the way you perceive how they will look and the way you'll dress them has also changed. changed. The house you perceived you would build has also changed. changed. So it's for some people, it's a cutting of their future. And that's why it can be that intense. And that's why some people will also try to fight because they are not just fighting for the relationship. They are fighting to ensure that their future, the future is what maintained. Wow. Wow. Well, I am here today with my co-hosts. So I'm not the only one with um, Dr. Seth. My co-host is also here with me. My darling, I need to train him to take over so that when I travel, there will be somebody sitting in my chair to take over. I won't be able to do it all the time. We are growing old. This year, 62. We won't always be around. So today, my co-host is with me um, to host Dr. Seth. Co-host, yes, I don't know the questions you have for Dr. Well, Seth. Very much. I think this is an exciting topic. Um, from the very first day, we decided to hold this at the Valentine service. Uh, we all realized it is deep-rooted mm-hmm. and almost... 
um, everybody needed to hear something about mm. it. So uh, the points that Doc has uh, raised, especially the last one about the rationalization, yeah. is quite telling. And I believe by now we are healing many homes, transforming lives, and bringing people back to the place of helping themselves. But um, Doc, in the rationalization yeah. um, that you spoke about, that it, does it have a background to raise? Is it the same for everyone going through a situation of heartbreak, abuse, etc.? Is it the same for everyone, male, female, uh, rich, poor, or backgrounds and certain things will make it different? The, the truth about rationalization is um, it, it's a process that our brains usually adapt to protect us from feeling uncomfortable emotions. Mm. That's what rationalization is. Now, I've explained severally how and why sometimes, you know, um, staying present is important. Mm. Rationalization okay. is a way of staying present. Okay. It's a way of telling yourself a part of the story that makes the pain less, mm. although it's not the reality. Mm. So when you rationalize, you are giving yourself evidence. So let's say my partner is abusing me physically, and I'm saying, oh, they are stressed at work. Mm. That way, I don't feel like my partner disrespects me. That's why mm. they are what? Oh. They are abusing me. Okay. So I will now say, oh, something is happening at work. Mm. Somebody is stressing mm. them out. So I've taken the pressure off my partner mm. onto the person, also for my own good. Because to think that my partner can do that to me mm. is painful on mm. my mind. So mm. we rationalize. And it doesn't really matter where you come from. You adapt in some kind of rationalization, which is your context specific. Mm. Uh -huh. Wow. Um, Dr. Seth, I want to ask a question. Heartbreaks make people very bitter and very unforgiving. From where I sit, I would say the Bible teaches us to forgive. their heartbreaks it's not easy to forgive Absolutely. it's not easy not to be bitter from your angle mm -hmm. how should the person forgive or how can the person train himself to forgive okay. i know people who've said to me Mama Rita, when i see him when i see him i feel like stabbing him i feel like st i mean how do you forgive? Forgiveness is a very conscious process. Mm. So I always tell people, forgive, but don't forget. Okay. Because to forget is such a huge thing. Okay. But to forgive is saying, I am accepting I've been treated badly. Mm. I'm accepting you did this to me. Mm. I'm accepting all of that, but mm. I choose not to dwell on it. Okay. That's what forgiveness okay. is. So when you have forgiven, you now see the person and it doesn't trigger okay. any emotions. Okay. Because what you do realize in the present is the person does not have the power to do any of those things to you ever again. Now, the other part of, you see, the bitterness is not just bitterness for bitterness sake. It's a protection. So some people become bitter because it protects them. This is how it protects them. If you, you hurt me so much, you hurt me so much, and I'm bitter about you, the protection for me is you will never have access to me ever again. Okay. So it's a psychological thing. It's, it doesn't show physically, but I will never give you opportunity to be anywhere close to me. Connotation. It, it does in the beginning. Okay. But after some time, mm. if you are bitter, what seems to happen now becomes the person is living their life. You are living your life. But they have so much control over mm. you. Mm. Yeah, so when somebody talks about them, suddenly you get into what we call a physiologic reaction. Your heart is beating and all the pain. And you are... That is where the bitterness becomes problematic. In fact, we always say that because your mind will always look for the good times. And it, it not, it's not looking for the good times because it was just enjoyable. But it's looking for the good times to say that I wasn't a fool. I wasn't an idiot. 
I, I, I loved him because he loved me or she loved me back. And so when your mind starts to do that, it tries to give you good times. And the good times may make you also feel like, hey, maybe it can work again. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see That's what why happens? some people good. go back. The, the going back is just... So maybe I should, I should start by explaining the way love forms in okay. people. Okay. 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 So if you look at it, by and large, biologically, mm -hmm. there are a number of things that happen. Mm -hmm. Nobody can fall in love without the initial physical attraction. Okay. That we will call we call the lastful stage. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it, it's based on you. You can't fall in love with somebody that you don't connect with. Okay. Or you can't have uh, an affinity for somebody you haven't connected. Mm -hmm. You should at least see them or hear them mm -hmm. or smell them. Mm -hmm. You know something mm -hmm. of that sort. Good. Mm -hmm. So in that stage. Everything is based on just a desire yeah. to be with the person. That's yeah. the first stage. Yeah. Okay. And we normally say that those are they are they are pushed to light by our hormones. Okay. The male and female hormone. That's yeah. testosterone yeah. and estrogen. Yeah. Now, once you get past that phase, yeah. you go into the attraction phase. Yeah. And in the attraction phase, that's where most people say, Odoma nipe Jimmy. That's true. Because what Odo happens, Jimmy. what happens in attraction is the part of your brain for reasoning, analyzing stuff, becomes hijacked. In fact, a lot of uh, uh, intellectual authors have said that the attraction phase of relationships mm. is almost like being addicted mm. to some substance mm. or something. Mm. So to get away from it, it's not easy at mm. all. Mm. So you keep on feeding your addiction mm. by doing the same things mm. that typically would even destroy the relationship. Mm. So you are always engaging. Mm. And mm. during that time, we know that in the brain, low in the brain, you have what we call dopamine. Mm. Dopamine uh, gives you pleasure. Mm. It gives you a sense of euphoria, like excessive mm. excitement. And then you have also uh, the role of adrenaline, mm. which is what kicks our system into gear when we are perceived to be in danger or when we are aroused. Mm. And then we also have serotonin. Serotonin is for happiness. Okay. So it's, it's prolonged, it's enduring, and pleasure, which is dopamine, is very short-lived. Mm. So it comes and goes. Now, when people have gotten past this, and this would normally last for about, let's say, about two years. Okay. The attraction phase. Okay. Then now we get into the attachment phase. That's where true commitment happens. Now, in attachment, it's not so much about physical. Okay. It mo it's more about living together, building together, mm. you know, doing things futuristically mm. in that sense. Mm. And during that time, what actually floods the human system are the hormones for bonding. So now it's not, it's not physical things mm. anymore, but there are more high feelings mm. that you might not mm. be able to, uh, to associate mm. with. Now, look at these three stages I have described. Mm. Depending on where your heartbreak comes, mm. your reactions will be different. are equally different. Okay. Wow. Wow. So the set of behaviors that I will put up in the initial phase compared to attachment, mm. uh, to, to attraction phase, mm. and then mm. attachment, mm. they are poles apart. Wow. And we also find that the age at which people also start, not duration, but age, age. Okay. also determines how difficult it is for them to move on. Younger people tend to find it more difficult. Wow. Yes. Than the older than ones. The older. So in terms of duration, they've stayed in for long. That mm -hmm. is different from the person who is falling in love at, say, 15 years, mm -hmm. as compared to 20, as compared to 50 years. Okay. 50, they've seen a lot in life. Okay. They understand so many things. Okay. So... It is not as intense okay. as the person who thinks his future. So I remember when I was younger, <coughs> the very first person I saw, I said, oh God, this woman I'll forever and ever cherish in my mind, you know? And I had started building castles in my mind about what life would be. In fact, I could never even tell this person I like you. Can just, you imagine? Uh, uh, we're just friends. <laughs> in primary, we had something we called Holland. Hope our love lasts and never dies. I will learn it. <laughs> <laughs> Holland. Hope our love wow. lasts and, and never, never dies. dies. Wow. <laughs> so you can imagine if if 
at that stage, the kind of emotions I felt, yeah. mm. and I got in, mm. and it was cut. Mm. Time would give me, I mean, ample time would give yeah. me uh, duration to, to heal. heal. But the feelings of it in the moment mm. being processed would have been huge because mm. at the time, I could see nothing else mm. but yeah. that. Mm. And that's why, for instance, <coughs> in adolescence, yeah, a lot of parents will fight with their children. This boy, this girl, this boy. And then in our minds, they are just naughty. They are just, no. There are a lot of things in the background that we are unaware of also. And then the part of brain that controls human regulation is not fully developed until yeah. after about 25 years. So yeah. there are things in the background that can be worrisome. Yeah. So in terms of bitterness, depending on where you are, you can become bitter. Mm. Depending on the actions mm. that were in the relationship mm. consistently, the mm. bitterness can come. Mm. For some people, the bitterness starts because even after they broke up, especially like in divorces, mm. all seem to be well. Mm. And then child custody will come in. Mm. And then mm. people now have to tarnish each other's image, image just to, I'll teach you a lesson. Mm. And they do this without considering mm. the impact on the child mm. Mm. And so the bitterness mm. is usually a defense mechanism now That's right. when people go through heartbreaks mm. it's a trauma mm. it's like being robbed mm. it's like uh, witnessing an accident or being an mm. accident so your brain also goes into high gear mm. where it's in survival mode mm. and when you are surviving mm. You are fighting all the time. Mm. When you are surviving, you are protecting yourself mm. aggressively. Mm. So they will protect themselves from enemies mm. and non-enemies mm. alike. Mm. Wow. Um, there's something else, but we'll go for a break. When we come back, you said we must train ourselves to forgive, but not to forget. Yes. We hear people saying all the time, forgive and forget. Why should you forgive and not forget? We will go on a short commercial break and we'll be back. It's getting very interesting. I'm learning so much myself. Please, we'll be back. Hello, people of God. This is Reverend Papa, and I'd like to specially invite you this and every Friday to prayer, miracle, and prophetic service right here, Royal House Chapel, every Friday. We are lifting up prayer. It's a time of worship. It's a time of the prophetic. You don't want to miss out at all. I will be there with other sons of the Apostle General, and it's going to be a wonderful time in the presence of God. The Bible says, be anxious for nothing, but by prayer and supplication, lift up unto God. Join me this and every Friday. It's prayer, prophetic, worship, and a wonderful time with miracles. 6 p.m. every Friday. I'll see you there. God bless you. Welcome back to Family Life with Mama Rita. If you are just joining us, I have with me Dr. Seth Asafo. Dr. Seth Asafo is not, is not a stranger on our screens. That is why I didn't go back uh, mentioning everything about him. I mean, he's been with us so many times and we enjoy him. I don't mind having him the whole year. I mean, I, I don't mind, except that for his time. It's not easy, my darling. You see this man here. It's not easy pulling him um, um, to the studio. Today, he's with this organization. Tomorrow, he's there. Um, another time, he's in Hope for a conference. Another, I mean, it's not easy. So, but for he's his, a wanted man. He's a very wanted man. <laughs> very wanted man. Recently, I even saw him on one show. What were they talking about? Ooh, I remember. Okay. 
I remember re just recently, I think just last week. Just last, so he's a very, very busy man. So if you are just joining us, in the past week we've been, um, since Valentine actually, we've been handling finding love again. And today we want to go into the psychological and um, sociological and anything, please all give the, me what? All the logicals. All the logicals <laughs> um, of finding love again. When people get hurt, when people get bitter, unforgiveness, you know, we want to go into it. We, we are talking about finding love again and we are here as though it's that easy, but before they find love again, they would have gone through stuffs. We need to deal with the stuffs they went through, the emotions, the psychological effects. I mean, so that now they can start on a clean sheet and then find love again. So, Dr. Seth, we were talking about forgiving and forgetting. You've spoken about forgiving, forgiving why we forget. must... Um, forgive mm -hmm. why shouldn't we forget okay so you see um from a from from an evolutionary standpoint mm -hmm. okay anything that can threaten your safety okay you must remember and that's why the mind is primed to identify the negatives okay before the positives okay so let's even take a, uh, an example on love okay a woman sees a man a man sees a woman mm -hmm. man says oh i like you i want mm. to and then the woman says to the man, promise me you won't hurt me, okay? Because she's trying to protect herself from, if you hurt me, it will pain me and I will not feel good. Then the man is also saying, how do I know you are not here to come and collect my money and go? Okay, because it's, it's from a safety perspective right. because everybody's trying to protect yeah. themselves. Now, when you look at what happens in the mind, yeah. any memory, that has an emotion attached, mm. is difficult to forget. Mm. Mm. So think about something extremely pleasant, like when your child was born. Mm. That memory, you hardly forget. Mm. But the intense emotions mm. associated with it has dropped. Mm. That, that's why I can't forget the first childbirth. I fainted at the labor. There you I go. I still remember. Absolutely. I give me see. The, give me the face of the nurse. <laughs> the there, <midwife. laughs> there you go. Now. Wow. People's uh, graduations, uh, their wedding ceremony, okay. somebody passing on. Okay. Now, when you tell somebody to forget, what you are doing is you are asking them to erase, mm. which is so difficult. Okay. But you can take the emotions out of the memory, mm. which is that the memory is there, but it doesn't unsettle me anymore. Mm. I mean, I've had a broken heart before, mm. but today I think about it. It doesn't do anything, okay. but I remember the broken heart. Okay. So when I say forgive, but don't be eager to forget. Okay. Because the more you try to force yourself to forget, the more difficult it is to actually forget. Okay. So we want to take the emotions out of the memory. Okay. That's why you forgive. Okay. The moment you forgive, the emotions lose their power. Mm. And it's the emotions that unsettle us. Mm. Wow. So why do people say forgive and forget? Uh, perhaps it is an, it's easier said than done. It's easier said um, than done. It's like, l l maybe it's metaphorical. It's okay. like saying, don't pay attention to it. Okay. Because by not paying attention, it does not create... Mm. I've always explained that, you see, as humans, when you think about something, mm. it becomes real. Mm. It's like you are creating a picture. Mm. And I've always used uh, movies to explain mm. that mm. we know it's a movie, mm. and yet we still feel the emotions. We still cry. <laughs> we still cry. It's, it's, a similar, mm. it's a similar scenario. So forgiving is you saying to yourself, yes, this happened. Yes, it made me sad. Yes, I'm still dealing with it. I'm not over the person yet. That is all part of forgiving. And when I see the person, I will feel these kinds of ways. You have become aware of them. So they don't take you by surprise. So you'll see somebody like they, they were in a romantic relationship. They broke up or there was a bad breakup. And for years, they've not seen each other. And then suddenly they meet somewhere. And as soon as they meet, somebody's heart is beating. It tells you that you haven't forgiven. forgiven. And that's why the emotions are showing. For other people, it's been 10 years. Now they meet themselves, hey, you. It's all fun and hugs and all of that, regardless of what it was. Because it is it's no longer raw. And that's why I always preach, forgive. 
But the forgetting is not a simple process. But, but Doc, I remember, mommy, sorry, the first episode, uh, we had one of the panelists, um, Dick Inalis, if I remember, mm -hmm. that after having gone through such a bitter betrayal, mm -hmm. if I can put it, it took her 13 years to be able to accept the ability of even loving again. Absolutely. So for that long, wouldn't it have been shorter if probably she tried uh, managing the memory probably in the first year, third year? How long should it take to deal with bitterness? I suppose she was trying to manage it, mm. but it wasn't easy. And that's why she had to go 13 years. So look at it this way. I deprived myself of 13 years because of the pain I was feeling. Mm. So not only did I deprive people out there who would have wanted me, but I wouldn't give myself permission to, mm. out of fear. Mm. Okay. Not out of choice. So there's the element of fear coming in. It's out of fear or out of the, the concern mm. that it will happen again. Mm. Mm. Because if not for that purpose, the person will say, I want to be alone. Mm. But there's a reason for it. And I talked about how um, breakups are like a trauma. Okay. Trauma puts your brain in survival mm. mode. And because you want to protect yourself, you say, anything that can come close to hurting me, mm. I will push away. Now, there are lots of people who do some very interesting things as defense mechanisms okay. for going to broken relationships. So we have men and women who date and like committed relationships where they were all in and they went out. Mm. And then now that they are out, even when they want to try, they're always looking for a signal to run away. And I've had so many people I work with who come and say, I don't understand. He, she, they were great. They never wronged me, but I ran away. Whoa. Or I found one thing, which was as simple as, I called him once, his phone was on busy, or I called her once, her phone was on busy, she didn't call me back. It means that's it, and the relationship is broken. And that's because they are looking for something. Their brain is still in, in survival. So anything that gives them a little hint okay. that there's a problem, I don't want to be part of it. So they run, and we say they are afraid of commitment, mm. not by choice, mm. but because they know when they get committed and they, they have a broken heart, it'll be too much for them. So to protect themselves, they avoid it. Now, avoidance is not a good coping mechanism. Okay. 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 Dog. It's always said that it's easier said than done. Than done. I remember my first major examination. We were told not to be afraid. But nobody taught us how not to be afraid. Absolutely. Mine was so bad that I was literally shaking. If you're a very experienced person, you could even hear it in my voice. Mm. It was so bad that when there was a break and we were asked to go and eat, the teachers didn't understand me why I couldn't eat, mm -hmm. why I was being slow in eating. And they made it worse by even shouting at mm, me absolutely. to eat fast and to eat. Absolutely. As a counselor, from where I sit, how do I train my counselors? To forgive okay because we always say forgive mm -hmm. how do they forgive okay so this comes from my my experience working with many couples okay and one of the statements that seems to come around consistently is how could I be so foolish okay. why why didn't I see it okay. why did I allow this into my life and the reality is when you start doing that, you are doing the self-blaming component of the blame. Mm. Okay. okay? Now, to forgive, 
we believe we are rational beings. We all believe ourselves to be smart. We all believe ourselves to be. So the moment it starts to happen, your rational mind is saying, why didn't I notice? And you forget the actual evidence why you fell in love with the person in mm. the first place. Mm. So it makes you think that you made a mistake. Mm. The first point in forgiving yourself is bringing it into context. So what I do with a lot of my clients is mm. I say, tell me about the beginning of your relationship mm. and I document everything. And then I'll ask you again, tell me about the breakup. Mm. Tell me about all the bad things that happened. Mm. And I let you write it. What am mm. I doing? I'm allowing you to vent it. Okay. See, in the back of the human mind is all these memories make us feel disconcerting emotions. Okay. So the brain in its way of trying to protect us mm. will also try and hide it. Mm. We call it repression. So it pushes it out of your awareness mm. to make it seem like it mm. does not mm. exist. Mm. But it's there. Mm. Making you talk about it, write about it, is making you bring it into consciousness mm. where you can process, mm. where you can say, ah, it's true that I allowed this man into my life, mm. but I did so because this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. And now, so what I always tell them, you are going out mm. because this happened, this happened. This. So there's a logical component mm. to making them realize that it is not just emotional or mm. it's just the feeling mm. coming but you can it's like putting the person on trial putting mm. yourself on trial mm. and asking yourself how mm. why mm. why mm. you ask the question to the point where your mind says ah i get it now so sometimes with my clients i do why therapy mm. i just keep asking why and why mm. and why and as you go deeper and deeper and deeper you come to the root cause mm. And you come to realize that even maybe the premise of the relationship was problematic from the beginning and then you can solve it. In a lot of um, situations with romantic relationships, we find that couples try their best to solve, I call the symptoms and not the, the issue. Okay. So there's a foundational issue, okay. but we're always dealing with the symptoms <laughs> exactly and then you can treat symptoms but the problem will still be there so little things will what mm. will, will spark mm. it again wow. and and doc mm. with with the explanation you've just given it just brings to mind people that i know have gone through such issues some appear to have gone over some of these things so easily others also brood over them for long do temperament, personality types play on how long a person is able to forgive or how easy a person is able to forgive? We're all very different. And I suppose I will, I will answer it in context of okay. the variables you have around you mm. in trying to deal with this particular change. Mm. So let me give for example. I mentioned how whenever we have a breakup, there's a void that's created. And every time that void is open, the brain says there's something wrong, there's something wrong. So you had routines that you used to do together. For anybody who is able to alter those routines, so in the mornings I used to get a call from this person at six. Now I choose to work out at six in the morning. Or listen to worship songs. Or listen to worship songs. What you've done is you have altered that routine. So before long, the triggers will lose this bearing because there's something else you are doing. Um, I used to hang out with him or her around this time. And now I have another group of friends who I go and do things with. That is one scenario. Second scenario is the social support you have. You mentioned the support system. Who are they? What are they telling you? So social support is an amazing variable when you are dealing with any kind of loss. Okay, okay. And I call heartbreak a loss too. Okay. The more people are around you and they tell you, I don't understand what you are going through, but I know it's difficult. I'm here for you. Alone is more powerful than trying to do it all by yourself. So, interestingly, you find that when it comes to men and women, women tend to do better I was at going getting to ask out that question. than men. Why? Because women engage, men don't. Okay. A woman will talk. This is painful. It's, they will insult the person. All of that is venting out. They are letting out. Oh. Men. 
Hmm. Oh, yeah. I'm fine. No, it's not a big deal. I mean, Odeshi. there are many women. Odeshi. Odeshi. Well, there are many women <laughs> out there. We say that logically, but emotionally, it's not true. Okay. Because your ego is also being hurt, but you are not venting out. So you are keeping everything within you, and it's causing tension. And the tension does not only affect your mental health, but your physical health. Okay. There are a lot of researches that tells us that if you look at committed long-term relationships, if one partner dies, mm -hmm. the likelihood for the other partner to die within one year is about 70%. That's true. If my my they, parents. Aha! <laughs> uh -huh, if they don't have enough social support yeah, They, they went them. weeks apart. Or but days. Then, I said they went weeks apart. Weeks apart. A month. Four weeks. Absolutely. So this is, this is how it normally operates in the background. Mm. Wow. So, actually, I was going to ask, heartbreak, is it different for women and men? It's, it's, it's largely the same thing. Um, from a psychological standpoint, the perception of how things will become mm -hmm. Is a significant thing mm. now let me say that socially there may be variables mm. for instance if somebody carries on a woman for a long time and then put her on the side of the road for men the marriage pool is quite easy mm. socially within mm. the ghanian social yeah. context yeah. so then the woman's way of recovery may be more difficult okay. than a man who knows that well, i can just go and then but I'm talking about people who are in committed relationships yeah. that have gone into the place of attachment. Yeah. Okay. The pain is more, it's, it seems to be the same across the same. board. Wow. Because they are in the same place where now it's like we've gotten past the, the playful and then fairy tale stage. Mm. And we are now in a place we are committed. We are committed. Mm. So it's more. So also looking at where you are in the attraction phase, it is the same because it's an issue of egos and an issue of self-worth okay now another interesting question that a lot of clients ask is is there something wrong with me okay because they always think that they, they, they did something wrong now i've always told my clients there's nothing important about knowing why they left mm. what's important is accepting they left okay because half the time if you have a heartbreak and you are feeling these intense emotions, even if the person tells you, I just didn't feel it again, your mind will never believe it. Because your mind is also looking for a dramatic answer why they left. <laughs> so it could be, I could tell you, oh, I was just not feeling it again. Your mind will never believe it. It's looking for something more. There was somebody better than me. So self-worth issues start to come in. It's about this, it's about that. And as you make those assumptions all over all the assumptions do is create a reality and your body reacts to the reality as if it were true when in many regards but, but it's look, not. you just mentioned sometimes you do why therapies and that helps get to the root cause of the issue yeah. is that not the same as trying to ask yourself why they left so when i do why therapy i'm guided by something okay when other when people go through it like a, a breakup and they are doing why therapies they are not asking because they want a solution. They are asking because they want to validate within themselves that they are not the problem. Okay. That's the difference. Mm. And it's not important at the time. Because all it does is to sink you even deeper. Basically, you sound like you can't help yourself. Somebody needs to guide you through the help. Is that in, in, in loss, social support is important. And someone to help you process the emotions and lead you back into a place of thriving is necessary. Wow. So you always need to reach out. You need to, I mean, look at, look at our cultural systems. If somebody loses a, a, a loved one, a family, what do they normally do? They sit down and then people will come. Then they see it and they'll narrate it. Yeah. Another person oh, will come. They will keep very narrating. Very and very and very very why do you think they do that? Oh. They are venting out. So if you look at the time when it happens, compared to when they've narrated it several times, the emotions go away. Oh. And they come so after some time, they even stop crying. Oh. Beautiful. So I always tell my friends in South Africa, within, when somebody dies, within a week or two, 
the person is buried. And we, it takes a month, six weeks, three months. So we were trying to analyze. And we said, for us, by the time we bury the person, we've come to terms. We've come to terms. We've finished all our crying. <laughs> so the truth is, by the time we are burying the person, there isn't too much of mourning. Yeah. Now I understand. Because I used to think it was a waste of time. Oh, no. When my parents died, my mom died first. People started coming to their house. Initially, I thought it was a waste of time. Ah, why are you coming to waste my time? When I have to rest, when I have to do something. And everybody that comes, you start the story again. The fact that um, she wasn't sick, she went to the hospital, she only fell down, they did the check, everything was okay, and then uh, she got hospital infection and blah. Ah, another person comes. They Oh, Absolutely. <laughs> so it's a mechanism. It's a mechanism to deal with your loss, to deal with your pain, to process it and allow it to go. So you come to an acceptance. So you see, in 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 loss, in loss, any kind of loss, our very first reaction is to deny that it's happening. So two people are dating. One means I don't want to do this again. The person who's been left will now be calling. I'm sorry, I'll make it work. That's denying the mm. fact that this is where the person is at. Somebody loses their life and in the clinic, those days when we used to break bad news a lot, you tell somebody, unfortunately, uh, the results show, and they'll say, <laughs> right then, then. That it's not possible. That is denial. Now, denial is good because in the short term, it allows you to take in the news gradually. Okay. So you deny in the in the immediate because if you accept to protect sometime, your shocks to protect good mm. so it's like a shock absorber and then gradually you come to accept it and it's easier to process mm. than to accept it at once so sometimes you can if somebody hears bad news and bah, they fall down at once mm. because it's too much it's a sensory so, overload for them so denial can sometimes be a protective mechanism but if you stay in denial too long <laughs> then you are in trouble. This is getting very interesting, but it looks like our time is up. What we'll do is we will close the curtain on you, but then we will continue with our questions and our discussion with Dr. Said, because I don't know when we are going to get him again. We will continue with him, and then we will come back to you next week with a part two of our discussion with him. But please let your questions flow. Let your questions flow. Please let your questions flow. After next week, we will let him come back to answer all your questions. Please, it looks like it was so fun. It was so interesting. We were not even looking at time. And looking at the questions I still have to answer, I still have to ask him. We will go ahead, my co-host and I, We'll go ahead with the discussions and then we will play it back to you next week just like we did to, on Valentine's Day. But thank you so much for enjoying us. Thank you for being with us on Family Life. Thank you that you make Family Life interesting. My darling, without you, we won't be doing Family Life. Same day, same time next week, we'll be on again with Dr. Said on part two of what we are discussing. God bless you and I love you. Easter Celebration 2024 with the Apostle General, Sam Crunchy Ankara. 
This year's theme is My Grace is Sufficient, 2 Corinthians 12 9. Join us in this year's celebration on the following dates Palm Sunday service, Sunday 24th March at 8 a.m., Good Friday services, Friday 29th March morning service at 8 a.m., and a power packed all night at 9 p.m. with water and salt feet washing. Resurrection Sunday services, joint morning service at 8 a.m. and communion anointing and impartation service at 5.30 p.m. The venue is the Oyu Dome, Obechebilamte Interchange. Come along with your family and experience His sufficient grace. The services will also be live on Facebook at Sam Crunchy and Kra, on YouTube at Powerline TV and on your favorite Christian TV channel, Powerline TV. Royal House Chapel, Touching our generation with the power of God.